In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I'm going to share my thoughts on Ace Bailey, the guy who I believe, as of right now, as of right now, it's still mid-August, but as of right now, the guy that I think has the best chance of surpassing Cooper Flag as the number one pick in the 2025 NBA Draft. I know it's still early, but this is my preseason scouting report on Ace Bailey. Shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I am your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board. And if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please subscribe, like, share, leave a comment. That's the best way that we can grow the channel. And big thanks to everybody that has been supporting the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast and whether it's the podcast or the YouTube channel for years. So, This year, I'm going to do something a little different. As of today, we got about a little under 80 days left until the start of the 2024-25 college basketball season. And to me, this is one of the most anticipated college basketball seasons in recent memory, simply because most of the top prospects are playing in college basketball this year. The last few years, we haven't been able to say that. We had Wimbayama, Victor Wimbayama, for those that don't know. But we had Victor Wimbayama in France. We had Scoot Henderson playing for the G League Ignite that year. Then last year, we had the two top picks, Zachary Reese and Alex Saar playing outside the country. And this year, I mean, there are some international prospects that I do believe will be in the lottery. But for the most part, for the most part, the top prospects in college basketball are freshmen again. And in the last episode, I did a scouting report on Cooper Flagg. But this episode, Ace Bailey is the guy that I'm going to cover. I am a big fan of Ace's potential, but I also have a lot of concerns. But Ace is the guy that I believe is the player that has the best opportunity to be the number one pick. I would not be surprised. Again, you can write this down, look at the date, and we can come back and and touch on this later on. But I would not be surprised if it's a... Scoot Henderson, Brandon Miller situation. Now, Scoot Henderson wasn't the number one pick, but he was definitely the favorite to be the number two pick pretty much all season long. Then Brandon Miller surpassed him. And then over their rookie years, Brandon Miller had a stronger rookie year. I think that right now, Cooper Flagg is the favorite. He's the one that everybody's putting their money on. But I think there's a chance that Ace Bailey could surprise a lot of people and be the number one pick simply because I do think there are some teams And some scouts that I've spoken with have agreed that there are some teams that think that Bailey has a higher upside. While they're saying that Flag has the the higher floor, but they're saying that Bailey may have the higher upside as a number one option or number one scoring option on the franchise. Right. Let's talk about Ace Bailey's background from Georgia. He's going to Rutgers like Rutgers like I I remember when he when he signed with Rutgers. I got a couple texts from from people that mostly followed the NBA, not necessarily college basketball or high school recruiting. They keep up with it a little bit, but they were like, Rutgers? Like, he's going to Rutgers with Dylan Harper, and that is a phenomenal, phenomenal class for Rutgers. I mean, it's a phenomenal class for any program, but there's a chance that Rutgers could have two of the top three picks in the 2025 NBA draft. And Ace Bailey, in my opinion, is the best prospect on Rutgers. He's the number two prospect on my board right now. And he is a, a, in my opinion, just a phenomenal, phenomenal talent, high upside. A lot of the scouting services had him as the number two prospect. And one of the reasons why he is, is, is so highly regarded is just because of his unique blend of positional size, skill, length, and athleticism. Now, he's drawn some comparisons to a guy I just mentioned, Brandon Miller. I think that there's some Brandon Miller in this game. I also think like he comes from the the Paul George school of jumbo do it all wings. That is what everybody's looking for in in this day and age. You're looking for that wing at about six seven plus that can handle the ball, that can shoot, that shows enough passing instincts, that can defend all over the floor, and that's pretty much like the coveted archetype that teams are looking for in wings. And Ace Bailey has. All of those tools. Again, I've seen him listed at 6'10", 
I saw him listed at 6'10 on Rutgers' site, but let's let's say that's accurate. 6'10, he can handle the ball, is a scorer. I mean, he is a gifted scorer, loves to get to the mid-range, and that's one of the reasons why I compared him to Brandon Miller, because when I watched Brandon Miller's film coming into his freshman year at Alabama, he relied heavily on the mid-range pull-up, showed flashes of like freaky athleticism, but there were times where I thought that he settled for the mid-range instead of attacking the rim. And he got to Alabama, and he didn't even shoot mid-range shots. I mean, Nate Oates, the system of Alabama doesn't – it's a, a, an NBA-style, analytics-friendly system. And so the mid-range was pretty much wiped out of Miller's game. So it would be interesting to see if the same thing happens with Bailey. But the reason why I compared him to Brandon Miller is because the positional size, the ability to get to a spot, shoot over the top of smaller defenders – the promise as a three-level scorer, and I, I think that Brandon Miller's success at Alabama and the success he had as a rookie in Charlotte and the fact that I think that he's a potential candidate to be on Team USA in 2028 bodes well for Ace Bailey, who, again, there are some people that I've spoken with believe he is the most talented prospect in this class. Now, one of the things that I have concerns about as far as Ace Bailey, and I'll touch on that a little bit deeper in the second segment, is his shot selection. Like, watching him play, I see this enormous talent that just doesn't maximize all his gifts and physical tools because he's predictable. You know it's going to be a couple dribbles, wop, 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 pull-up jumper. Now, when I watch the pull-up jumper, I see, you may think I'm crazy, but I see some flashes of T-Mac, Tracy McGrady, with his ability to just elevate over guys and just shoot over the top of defenders. But in order to reach that T-Mac level, I mean, that's a crazy level. I mean, T-Mac was 25 point per game score. I think Bailey, I don't think he's the same caliber athlete. Now, he's a very, very, very good athlete. Don't get me wrong. I don't think he's the same caliber of athlete as T-Mac, but I would like to see him become a much better finisher at the rim. All right, but in the second segment, I'm going to talk a little bit more and go in depth about Ace Bailey's offensive repertoire. And then in the third segment, I'm going to talk about the areas of improvement because I have quite a few. And then I'm going to talk about his draft projection and some teams that I think would be a good fit. But before I get into the second segment, let's talk about game time. Why? Why do I want to talk about game time? Because game time is my favorite app when it comes to looking for tickets, whether it's sports, concerts, comedy, theaters, and more. Now, for me, I'm only using them for sports. Now, maybe my wife may want to go to a theater or something like that, but for me, it's all about sports, and when I'm looking for tickets, I'm going to game time because game time has the best last-minute deals. Just off the top of my head, I can name that I went to um, I went to the Errol Spence Terrence Crawford fight well I should have mentioned Terrence Crawford first because I am from Omaha Nebraska but I went to the Crawford Spence fight last July bought my tickets on game time I went to a Yankees game in June or last June and I bought my tickets on game time I've bought tickets on game time for Dallas Wings even um, I bought some for my for my siblings um, all-star weekend I think it was like the Saturday night events so I'm a big fan of game time they have flash deals where you can get seats just right ahead of the event and they have the zone deals I like the zone deals because you allow you pick the section and game time will pick the seats and that way you can save a lot of money there and then my favorite feature is the all-in pricing. Just toggle it on the app and you can find out the exact price. I mean, there's no surprises. I've used plenty of other apps where, an example, the ticket may be 60 bucks. By the time I get to the checkout and ready to give them my credit card information, the price jumped up to $160 because they had $100 in extra fees. And with game time, they have the all-in prices and then you get the views of the seat. You can actually see the seat that you're sitting in or the seat that you choose, you can actually see the exact views. It's not just a, a random um, generic photo. It's actually a panoramic view from the seat. And you can look at it before you buy. Then they got the lowest price guarantee. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference. If you can find a cheaper ticket and your ticket is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry, so you can take the guesswork out of buying tickets, whether it's to Major League Baseball, NBA, and so on. All you have to do is download the Game Time app, 
Create an account. Use the code Locked On NBA, and you can get twenty bucks off your first purchase. Again, download the Game Time app. Create an account. L O C K E D O N NBA. You can get twenty dollars off your first pictures. Yeah, I'm sorry, your first purchase. I keep thinking about the pictures that you will get from your seat. So download the Game Time app. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Once again, thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. But for your second listen, man, if you enjoy the Locked On NBA Podcast, a Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, you're going to enjoy the Locked On NBA Podcast because there is no off-season on the Locked On Network. And Locked On NBA has coverage from national and local experts that are giving you all the information you need about the NBA, even in the off-season, and they keep you entertained It is available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. It is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. All right, second segment, I'm talking about Ace Bailey, and we're going to talk about his offensive skill set. One of the things I really, really value in prospects, and maybe I lean on it a little too much, but I love offensive creativity. I love guys that can get a shot. I love guys that get buckets. I love guys that have a scorer's aura. And Ace Bailey fits that. And I love the fact that he has excellent positional size at 6'10", can handle, can shoot. I think he's a good three-point shooter. I think that his offensive repertoire at a young age, right now he's only 17 years old. He is well advanced for his age as far as offensive skill set. And I think he has all the tools to be a number one option in the NBA at some point in his career. Maybe not right away and early because he's so young. He'll only be 18 on draft day. But I think he has all the tools to be a guy that you can give the ball to and get 20, 25 points a night on a, on a, on a good NBA team. Not necessarily saying that just because a guy averages 20 points per game means he's, he's um, good enough to be featured on a winning team. But I think Ace Bailey has all the physical tools, again, size, length, athleticism, ball handling, just an advanced skill set. I do think that he has potential to really be impactful in pick and rolls, not necessarily as a pick and roll playmaker right now, but I do think that you can give him ball screens. And because he has this advanced ability to stop and pop and get to a sweep spots, I think he's going to be able to punish drop coverages because he is a good mid-range shooter. Now, of course, it's going to be dependent on if the team allows him to shoot mid-range shots because the analytics say the mid-range shot, and I get it. I get it. It's a contested shot. It's a shot that, um, you know, it's just not a high percentage shot, but I think that if you're going to be a Featured score in the NBA, like a high-level score, I do think that you need to have a mid-range game. Now, if you're a complimentary guy, then maybe the mid-range isn't as important, but I do think the mid-range is important, especially with a high ball screen and you got you know, a, a center, I'm thinking like a, a guy that's going to play drop coverage all the time. I think you can punish them by knocking down mid-range shots. Now, I do think that he's going to need to improve as a playmaker, but I'll get into that in the third segment. But finishing at the rim, it's like he kind of teases me. The tools, the speed, athleticism, the vertical pop, he has all of that to be an elite finisher at the rim. I think maybe he'll need to get stronger. But right now, it just seems to me as if he would much rather take a mid-range pull-up than dunk on somebody. And I get it, you know. The mid-range pull-up is not as taxing on your body. But once he gets stronger, I, I, I look for him to become a more efficient or more willing finisher at the paint. Because in my opinion, I think he has three-level score written all over him. He can shoot off the catch. He can shoot step back threes. Now, he's a little reliant on the step back threes, but I just think his offensive skill set just totally fits the modern NBA. He has the size to score in the mid post. I think he can develop into somewhat of a low post score, even though you don't see teams using their wings and playmakers out of the, the low post a lot, but I do think that he has the ability to just exploit mismatches. If you put a bigger defender on him. I think that he can, 
you know, with his handle and his creativity, create space. If you put a smaller guy on him, I think that he could punish him in the mid post and the low post. Again, three level score. I think that is what he will be in the NBA. But he has a few things that he'll he'll need to work on to improve to get to that point. And then I also think that he could be a really, really impactful transition finisher just with his long strides and his athleticism. But he has a tendency to to rather be a floor spacer in transition than a play finisher. Now, I would love for him to be more of a play finisher, but he's a, a threat to, to, to be a floor spacer in the open floor, especially if you have like a rim running big. But I think he has the tools to become a really, really, really impactful player that can score, whether it's driving to the rim, mid-range, deep threes, creating his own shot, and even in transition. And another area that I really like about Ace Bailey is that he plays with an edge. He has this competitive fire. He's intense. He wants to win. And sometimes it may get the best of him. Like, for example, I think it was, was it the McDonald's game? I felt like, and this is just my opinion, maybe I could be wrong, but I felt like there was this this um in his mind this this mindset of all right everybody's talking about cooper flag they're saying he's the number one player in his class but i'm i want to show everybody that i'm just as good and so i felt like he can he he was getting caught up a little bit in the one-on-one which led to some 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 bad shot selection but i love the fact that he's competitive he wants to compete he wants to show everybody that he's the best player on the floor and he has the mentality that I think fits well for a guy that you want to be your go-to guy. I love that about him. Again, he's competitive. There's some guys that are really skilled. They're so skilled and they're so talented. But in order to reach that next level to maximize their full potential, they don't have like that. I mean, it's a it's a term that's been overused, but that dog. It's that, it's that extra edge. And I think that Ace Bailey has that because he wants to prove night in and night out that he is the best player on the floor. And again, he's only going to be 18 on draft day. So that's something that I'm I'm really high on as far as like what all he brings to the table and his potential. All right, when we return, I'm going to talk about some areas of improvement because I have quite a few and and I've mentioned a few here and there, but there's some areas that I would like to see him improve on this year that I think could give him a better chance of being the number one pick. And then I'll talk about some teams that I think would be a good fit. But let's talk about FanDuel. Why? Because I love sports and I love them so much that I just don't want sports to stop. But as the summer winds down and the games just aren't, there's not a lot of games on TV, we get fewer games and the sports just aren't sporting like I want them to. But FanDuel keeps the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and I can dream up bets anytime that I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers, again, all customers, with a boost or a bonus every single day. So that's right, daily, there's something for everyone all day, every day, all summer long. So just head over to FanDuel and start making the most out of the last few days of your summer. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, last segment. So here are a few areas that I would like to see Ace Bailey improve on. And I think that if he can make these improvements or show strides of improvement, I think that there is a chance, a small chance, that he could be the top pick in the 2025 NBA draft. Number one, I think he has to improve his shot selection. He has a tendency to settle for contested jumpers over attacking the rim. I talked about that in the second segment. But I do think that if he can improve his shot selection, then there is a chance because I don't think it's out of the question for him to have an inefficient freshman season. Now, even if he is inefficient, I think there's a chance that he could still be the number two pick. But if he can improve his shot selection, limit the the one the the possessions where the ball doesn't move the isolation where he faces the guy down, jab, jab, pull-up jumper. You know, it's kind of the same things that people criticize Jason Tatum for, 
while he was at Duke and Tatum didn't end up being the number one pick, but he, you know, that was, <laughs> that was a mistake. But I do think that um, a Bailey needs to just improve his shot selection, not get too caught up in the isolation and one-on-one aspects of the game. And I get it with his, with his youth and his ability to score, it's easy to say, I, I can take this guy, I can score anytime I want. Sometimes you can get better shots if you can get others involved. Another thing that I would like to see him improve on is his decision making as far as passing. Now, in order for him to, to, to reach his full potential as a scorer, I think he's going to have to become a better passer simply because the defenses are going to be keen on him. He's going to, this year at, at, at Rutgers, he's, he's going to have Dylan Harper to ease some of the pressure. But Later on down the line, when he becomes the number one focal point on the the scouting report, the defenses are going to key on him. And if he's not a good passer, they're going to send doubles and traps from different angles. So I think him improving as a playmaker and a passer not only will help his draft stock, but it will also help him as a scorer. Because if you look at some of the best scorers in the NBA, and he's not like these guys, but whether it's LeBron or Luka or Trey Young, Jokic, Giannis, all of these guys are really good passers. Now, I don't think he's going to be that level of, I'm almost certain he's not going to be that level of playmaker, but if he can watch Jason Tatum, for example, Jalen Brown, two guys that weren't necessarily good passers entering the NBA, but over years they've become better. I think for Jalen Brown, like his assist to turnover ratio was underwater for like the first four or five years in his career. But I would like to see Bailey improve his decision-making, work on becoming a better passer, studying the game, learning where the double team is coming from, and I think it will open up his offense if he becomes a much better passer. And then, I mean, I guess it goes into shot selection, but the ball stopping, I want to see if the Rutgers staff has the – has the influence to kind of get him to ease out of being a ball stopper. I And I'm just speaking my mind here. I think it's a unique situation because at Rutgers, they have a really, really unique opportunity with their recruiting class to set the tone for future recruiting classes with all the eyes that are going to be on Bailey and Harper. And so sometimes, and I've seen it on, I mean, I guess LSU comes to mind with Ben Simmons to where some of his habits, and it was mostly off the court, but some of the bad habits weren't necessarily corrected because he just had so much power. And so I'm curious to see if the the staff at Rutgers can ease Bailey away from playing as a ball stopper, if they can get him to play a more team-friendly system. Not saying he's a ball hog, but he just does have a tendency to be a ball stopper, which to me is totally totally natural if you can score like the way he can score and so it's easy for him to think that he has a better chance of making a tough contested shot where he dribbled the ball out the shot clock than passing to open teammate I get it but showing that he's not a a ball stopper I think go a long way in improving his draft stock which is already sky high and another thing is even though he is a a good ball handler. He can handle the ball. I do think that the handle was a little loose from time to time. If he can tighten it up, because I think there are some teams that are going to try to defend him with small, pesky guards, trying to get up in his airspace. So I think if he can improve the handle, just tighten it up a little bit, I think that can also help. Now, as far as draft projection, best case scenario, number one. But, you know, in the draft and every year in August, there are guys that we think are going to go really, really high, and sometimes they don't. A lot of times they, they don't. Like these preseason, and, and as somewhat part of the media, I, I get it. You you want to engage your, your followers with content, with the early season mock drafts and preseason scouting reports and so on, and sometimes you're just totally wrong and, 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 and totally off base, and I can think of a few guys that were projected to go really, really high. I mean, the first name that comes to my mind is Yannick Sosa. Totally different position. A couple years ago, some people thought he was going to be the number one pick. Didn't live up to the expectations. I know Jaden Hardy was a guy that some people thought was a a candidate to go number one in, the in, I think it was the 2022 draft. And so I think Bailey has a range of top two, but you just never know. The situation or the season could not go as planned and he could end up falling. But I think that even if he has a, a season where he's inefficient from the floor, I think with his talent 
and his skill set, I think somebody's going to roll the dice and take him no lower than number five. But anyway, I want to talk about some teams. If you're the Brooklyn Nets, I think Bailey is a, a good place to start if you end up with the one or the number two pick. I think the Washington Wizards would, would be a, a good fit just because I think that they, in the last two drafts, they, they've addressed their need for like versatile defenders and the two French guys, Bilal Koulibaly and Alex Saar. But I think Ace Bailey, if available for them in their draft range, would give them like that dynamic score that would kind of set the pecking order. And then you got like... Detroit, I expect them to be in the mix. San Antonio could also be in the mix as far as having a high lottery pick. I mean, there are quite a few teams that could use, uh, you know, a guy that's 6'10", that can handle the ball, that has upside as a three-level scorer and has the the physical tools to defend all over the floor. So his skill set and his position is highly coveted in the league. Utah, Charlotte, Portland, Chicago, Toronto, Who knows what's going to happen with Atlanta? I don't know if they're going to be in the lottery again, but I I think that Ace Bailey would be a good fit. If they keep their same team and they're not as good, if you can roll out a lineup of Trey Young, Ace Bailey, Zachary Reese, I mean, you have size and athleticism and and length in in, in the backcourt. So anyway, once again, That is another episode, or this is another episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. This is the second preseason scouting report I've done. If you missed the first one, check it out. I'm just going to go down the line. I mean, we got like 78, 79 days until college basketball, so we have plenty of days to pump out these preseason scouting reports. Again, these are preseason scouting reports. They could totally change or sound different in May and June. But once again, it's Rafael Barlow representing the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. So thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. But check out Locked On NBA Podcast. It's where the NBA season never ends. And you can get analysis from the local or national experts on the NBA. And it is part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Again, it's Rafael Barlow. And I am out of here.